Thank you very much, Brian. So I didn't have to awkwardly unplug everything and try and transition over here. I learned my lesson. I used to try and put a video up there as a bumper, and for whatever reason, every time I preach, the video doesn't work. And so I end up awkwardly transitioning. So uh, at least with a human, I, you know, I can uh, count, count on him. So you did very good. Thank you very much. <laughs> As, uh, as I was singing in first service, it really hit me, that song, Great Is Thy Faithfulness, that's, that's such a good song anyway. Um, but all week, you know, I, we had rehearsal here with the worship band, and then I, I played it on my own, of course, throughout the week, and, and it never really hit me, but my sermon today could easily be entitled, Great Is Thy Faithfulness, because that's really what this is about, it's about the faithfulness of God. Last week, we looked back at a familiar Bible story. We looked back, uh, Pastor Brent uh, talked about Jonah, and he did not want to go to Nineveh, if you remember. And of course, the, the giant fish followed him up, and, and God put him where he wanted him. And last week, uh, Pastor Brent used a quote, and to quote him, he said, God will ask you at times to do things you do not want to do. And today, we're going to dive into another familiar Bible story. We're going to go back to Sunday school for the second week in a row. I hope you're okay with that. And we're going to continue on that theme of God asking you to do some hard things. God asking you to do things you may not want to do. We're going to start off by talking about children. Uh, children are a blessing. I've got four of them. Three of them apparently wanted to hear me preach, so they're in here for whatever reason. And uh, children are a blessing, and, uh, but they're, you know, in the moment, you may not always think that. <laughs> children can be hard, right? They can test your very last nerve. Uh, they're expensive, they eat a lot, and they're little, uh, they're little jerks, as uh, Pastor Brent has put it before, and sometimes they really are. You're, you've grown out of that, right? You're not, I'm 13, you're not okay? Jerk. I'm not You're, you're 13, more. you're at the height of your jerkiness, I think. Uh, but children are hard, but they are a blessing. Um, think about the creation of life. Just, just That's a miracle on its own. Um, and the first command that we see God give man, after man and woman uh, are both, uh, both created, is God says, be fruitful and to multiply, to fill the earth, to have a family, raise kids. That's a command that we're given. It's the creation mandate. And just a quick disclaimer, I'm not saying everybody has to have kids. Um, in fact, not everybody has to be married. But for most couples, when they're married, it, it, their, their process looks something like this. Find a spouse, get married, and then a few years down the road, start to have kids. For most couples, that's just a, a normal routine. Uh, for Amber and I, it looked like this. We met in 1999. We dated for five glorious years, right, honey? Glorious. Uh, five years. <laughs> we got married in 2004. And then four years later, Camden, our firstborn son, uh, was born. And I can still remember with great vivid detail that time in my life. Uh, Amber and I had consciously decided, you know, hey, we, we've been married for a while, we're ready, we're going to start to have kids. And so we started planning, you know, how that goes, uh, couples, and, and so um, we took a test, you know, your pre home pregnancy test, and, and, and I'm all excited, you know, it's our very, very, very first test, and I, I don't know what to expect, and I'm just, I'm just excited, and, and we take the test, and of course it's like forever while you're waiting for the results, right, and it comes back negative. <laughs> It's like, it's, like, it's like you're up here on a roller coaster, and then like next thing you know, you're down here, but except you don't have that cool feeling of dropping down the hill. You're just there. And so like, like the, the floor dropped out. Like I was just real disappointed. Uh, but at the same time, I'm thinking, this is the first time. No big deal. We got other times. We got, you know, uh, part of the journey is trying, right, couples? And so we're amen. like, we're like yeah, amen. Uh, he, he teaches our marriage class, by the way. So, uh, yeah, so like, I'm like, okay, we, we got next month. No, nothing to worry about. And so that was like, I want to say that was a Tuesday. Um, and so that weekend, my dad and stepmom, my family, were coming in to visit us. They live in Maryland, and they come out once a year. And so I took that Friday off, and I was there, and they came in in the afternoon, and, and I get time to hang out with my dad and, and stepmom. She, she pretty much raised me from middle school on, and, and so I got time to hang out with them. And so we're waiting on Amber to come home from work, and we decided when Amber gets home, we're going to go out and have dinner. Right? Like, I'm not a good cook, and my parents... They're not going to want to cook with it, you know, what you like cook. So we're going to go out, and we decided we're going to Quaker Steak and Lube in Milford. So we're waiting for her to get home. She comes home, quickly comes in, says hi, changes, and we're out the door. And my parents are getting in the car, and Amber kind of pulls me aside, and she's like, I took a test, and it was positive. This is on Friday. And I'm, I'm like, of course, I'm an idiot, because I'm, I'm thinking about next month. I'm like, what test are you talking about? <laughs> she's like, a pregnancy test. And I was like, are you sure? She lots of two at work, and they were both positive. And so, um, like, I mean, I'm just, like, I can't contain my joy at this point. And, and Amber knows me. I'm not very good with, you know, keeping secrets anyway. So 
I'm like, how, my parents are right there. How am I not gonna tell them that we're gonna have our first child? And uh, cause you know, like most couples, they don't wanna tell everybody as soon as you get pregnant. It's early on, who knows what could happen. <laughs> There was no way I wasn't telling somebody. And so she's like, you can, you can tell your parents. And so over dinner, I told them. And uh, you know, I remember like every detail about that night. Like, I remember what I ordered to eat and what my dad ordered to eat, weird. And uh, like, I look back at it like it's just a joyous time in my life. But then I also realized that some people look back at, at that time and have sorrow and, and grief. Not everybody uh, can get pregnant right away, right? And so. Pastor Brett's been very open uh, about, about his and Whitney's trials in getting pregnant, and I did not know uh, Pastor Brent at that time, um, but we've had family members as well as, as other close friends who have just had trouble uh, getting pregnant, right? And so for them, it took multiple years, multiple doctor visits, even some procedures, a lot of money uh, to get pregnant. And so that's kind of our backstory today. We're talking about Abraham. But in our story, our backstory, we're going to bring in Sarah, Sarah's his wife, and he and Sarah had a lot of trouble conceiving a child, and I mean a lot of trouble. And um, kind of the downside of doing kind of a one-off sermon is we don't have time to explore every detail in this backstory, but I'm going to give you guys some references. If you want to check that out on your own, uh, you can do so. so. The first time we see God promise Abraham a child is in Genesis chapter 12. And he says, I will make you, uh, uh, through you, will, will, will be a great nation. And so he's, he's promising him a child and then therefore grandchildren and, and so forth down the road, right? So you find that in Genesis chapter 12. We're not, not going to get into it, but if you want to write that down, that's the first place you can find this. And in that passage, I believe it's in verse 4, it's, it, it tells us how old Abraham is. And I think that he gives us that detail on purpose. It says that Abraham is 75 years old. Now, his wife, Sarah, is 10 years younger, so she's roughly 65 years old at this point. And we fast forward all the way to Genesis chapter 21, and we finally see this son born. His name is Isaac. By the way, we'll be in Genesis chapter 22, if you want to flip there. But Genesis chapter 21, if you want to drop that down, is where we see Isaac finally born. And again, it tells us Abraham's age. It says Abraham is 100 years old. That puts his wife at 90 years old when she gives birth. Just imagine that, ladies. And so we do the math. 25 years has gone by since the first time God promised Abraham a child to when a child finally came. That's a long time. And just, just trying to put yourself in that situation. Um, some people here probably had a little bit of trouble taking a few years to, to conceive a child. 25 years, imagine the emotional roller coaster they're on, especially when God himself promises you a child and it seems to never, never come. And in fact, we won't explore it, but, but Sarah becomes so convinced that she will not bear a child that she gives her servant to Abraham and says, hey, I'm not gonna bear a child. Have, have your child with, with her, and we'll, we'll raise the child, right? So she gets kind of desperate. A child is born to that situation, and through that child, we see the seed of a nation of, of, of Islam, uh, the Islamic nation we see today, and it says the Islamic nation is for every thorn of, in the side of the, the nation of Israel, um, and that comes from this relationship. Both kind of both Christians and, and and Muslims they claim Abraham as their 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 father. You can trace back to lineage, and it's completely true. And if you want to explore that further, look at our YouTube page. Uh, Pastor Duke he comes here about once a year, and he has explored that uh, in many of his sermons. So if you're interested in that, he talks about that. So we see 25 years go by, and then Isaac is finally born. Uh, just imagine for a minute what kind of uh, special child he was. You know, his parents were probably super, super overprotective <laughs> of this child. You know, you waited 25 years for one, and you only get one. You've got to make sure this one is, is well taken care of. He was a miracle baby. Uh, not just in the sense that they couldn't conceive a child. That, that's a miracle in its own that they conceived. But now you have Sarah well past childbearing age. She's 90 years old. That's another miracle in itself. I think God sometimes does that where the only explanation is him. There is no other explanation for them having a child at their age and, and, and when they tried for so long. The only explanation is, is God. And so he's, he's a miracle from God. He's a miracle baby. And so I just want to kind of tell you that as a backstory. I just want you to understand how special this boy is. 
uh, not just for the nation of Israel, but to his parents. This is a special, special child. And so now we're going to jump over to chapter 22, and we'll be in today's text. We're going to start right from verse 1, and uh, I'll read it off here. It's on the screen if you need it as well. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And Abraham responded, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Well, that's tough to read. We went from Genesis chapter 12 all the way to chapter 21. We waited 25 years for this child to be born. Then the very next chapter, God says, Hey, Abraham, that son, your only son, the one I know you love, I want you to take him to the land of Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering. I want you to kill your son for me. Like that's, that's, that's tough. That's really tough. As a parent, to read, that's tough to fathom. Like you'd be thinking, like, did I read that right? Like, let me do a double take. Where, where's God going with this? And this is one of those times where in the moment, you're like, I just don't see where, where God's going with this. But then you look back and, and God provides, right? And so two quick notes before we jump on in Scripture I want to make right here before we go on. Uh, he told him to go to the land of Moriah. Just to give you some geographic uh, locations for this, the, the land of Moriah was a mountain range, the Moriah mountain range. Today, they're called the Judean mountains, and that's where Jerusalem is. Jerusalem is in this mountain range uh, there. The other thing I want to take note of is he, he told Abraham to go for a burnt offering. That's sort of significant here. If you read through the Old Testament, you can, you can read in, in a number of the books where they detail different types of offerings, and there are a ton of different offerings the burnt offering was considered the most holy. The reason being is the entire offering is consumed. There is nothing left. You are giving 100% of it to God. And so, so that's, I want you to just, just take that away before we move on. So in verse 3, we're going to pick it up, and we're going to see how Abraham responds to this seemingly, seemingly crazy uh, situation of command. Verse 3, it says, So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off, and Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. We see immediately the words are put into action. God, God gave a command, and we see Abraham's faith, and he puts that command to action right here. And so Abraham's thinking back on that promise. So God promised him a son. He didn't just promise him a son. He promised him descendants. He promised to make a great nation. That takes more than one person. That takes grandkids, grandkids, you know, great grandkids, and so forth, to make a great nation. So, so Abraham's looking back and saying, well, God promised me this, and you know, we don't know a whole lot about Isaac's age, but we have some clues we'll get into in a minute. But we do know he hasn't had a child of his own yet. So, so, so Abraham has faith, and he's like, God, God will provide. I'm, I'm going to go ahead with this. And so he remembers that, and he prepares for the sacrifice. When I, when I get to heaven, uh, there's a number of questions that I want to ask people. You know, I, I hope that we're able to do that, just have normal conversations with some of the people we read about. This is one of those times where I really want to talk to Abraham and, and just ask him, was your faith really that strong? Did you ever have a doubt? in your mind? Did your faith ever waver in your heart? Like, I'd really like to know the answer to that. And I'd ask him about verse 5. He uses a word in here that I'd ask him about. Just go back to verse 5 and read it. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. That word, we. Like, what do you mean by that? Did, did you really think the whole time that him and Isaac would come back and meet these guys and journey back home? Or was this kind of a comforting word to the servants? We're not really sure if the servants even knew what, what they were doing. If they, if they, they knew that Abraham was out there to sacrifice Isaac. You know, if he told him, hey, you stay here. We're going to go in the mountains. I'm going to kill my son. I'll be back. Would they have tried to stop it? You know, that's, I, I don't know, right? So was he, was, he, was he trying to put them at ease? Now think about this for a second. Did, did Sarah know what was going on? We don't have any clues. We don't know. But I often think of, uh, have you guys ever seen like your wife or maybe your mom, if you remember, like Mama Bear coming out? Like when you mess with somebody's kids, Mama Bear takes over. And like, you don't want to mess with Mama Bear. Sometimes it comes out, you know, in amber. And I just, I don't 
let her take care of that. Like, uh, mama bear is fierce. Like, does Sarah, does Sarah know? Like, I just see Mama Bear coming out of Sarah and be like, he ain't taking him anywhere. Like, no. Like, I don't know. I'd like to ask him about that. Like, these are, these are questions I have, right? Uh, so let's continue in our reading here in, in verse 6. It says, So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told them, told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. This stuff is getting pretty real now. He's not just taking action. He is now bound his only son, and laid him, laid him on the altar. These, these verses contain a wealth of information for us, and they really talk about, again, Abraham's faith, but they also let us in on the dynamic between Abraham and his son Isaac. It lets us in uh, a little bit of, of how that relationship uh, is working here. And in fact, in these verses, we're given the best clues to the age of Isaac. If you remember back to Sunday school, you may have seen like there's pictures of this in your Sunday school lesson. And oftentimes Isaac is portrayed as either like a little baby or a little child. That probably wasn't the case. He was probably older than that. And, and we don't know for sure, but here, here, here's why I say that. We're giving some clues. In verse 6, we just read it. Abraham gave the wood to Isaac. So he put it on him. Probably meaning he bundled it up and put it on his back to carry. I, I just think of my boys. My boys are, are 8 and 10. I'm just thinking, if I put some wood on their back, how many pieces of wood will actually make it up the mountain? Like, I'd be lucky if I had kindling by the time they actually get up, get up there. I'm thinking two pieces, three pieces at most, right, for an 8 to 10-year-old. Well, Isaac is carrying enough wood for a complete burnt offering. Right? And, and again, remember the burnt offering consumes the entire thing. We're not talking about a little campfire here. We're probably talking about a sizable fire. So he's probably carrying a good amount of wood. And so we just kind of think, Okay, what, at what age can they do that? A few other clues we have is the word lad. Uh, we, we've already seen it once when, when Abraham said the lad and I will, will go and we will return. It'll be used again in a second. That word lad in the original text is, is pretty varied. It means anywhere from about six years old to about 36 years old. And then the last clue we have is that he actually has some working knowledge of the offering. He says, Dad, I, I, I see the fire. I got the wood. Where's, where's the lamp? So he's at least got a little bit of, of knowledge about that. Most biblical scholars believe that he is a healthy teenager to young man. So anywhere from about 14 to maybe 25. A lot of people will just put an age to, to put it right in the middle at about 18 years old. And so we're talking about somebody, you know, a healthy, uh, you know, an older person. We're not talking about a little kid here, right? And so in, the, in time, they get to the place that God tells them here. This is the place. Stop here. And so we see Abraham, he probably helps you know, get the wood off of Isaac's back, and he starts to build an altar. And it says he laid the wood in order. There's a certain way that the wood would lay, and so he does that. And, and now we see him binding his son. So probably, you know, his wrists and his, his ankles. And at that moment, Isaac now knows the answer to the question he asked previously. When he said, I see the fire, I got the wood, but where's the second? He now knows that he is that sacrifice. And what I find really, really interesting about this, if you want to just explore this, when he binds him, again, we're talking about Abraham, who's 100 years old when Isaac was born. If we just use the rough number of, of 18 for Isaac, that puts Abraham at 118 years old. Just, just think back to your youth. Think back when you were a teenager. Could you probably have outran your grandpa? <laughs> Probably could, right? Your grandpa probably didn't have great mobility by the time he is 70, 80, however old he was. My grandfather just passed away last month. He was 92. And I think back to, to my youth, I could outrun him probably since I was six years old and older. I don't know. I'm just thinking here. And, you know, think back to when you're healthy and a young man or young woman, you could probably overpower your grandparents as well. Although my grandpa would still whoop me until I was I know, probably 18, but I could probably overpower him by then. Of course, I wouldn't. But here, here we see Isaac, 
and we see him allow himself to be bound. He probably could have run away. He probably could have pushed Abraham off the side of the mountain if he wanted to, but he, he doesn't. He allows himself to be bound. He doesn't put up a fight. And here's just kind of what, what I'm picturing. Again, I'm kind of reading into this a little bit, but, but you know, once Abraham bounds his wrists and his, and his ankles, and, and it says that he laid his son up on the altar, I, I kind of see it as Abraham you know, trying to go down and lift him. I, I, almost, I almost see Isaac saying, Your Dad, I got it. Don't worry, I'll, I'll lay you. I, I almost see Isaac just willingly just laying laying up there so his elderly father doesn't have to, to, to lift him up there. He doesn't put any fight up at all. He submits himself to his father even unto death. He knows what's coming. He's not a dumb, dumb boy. He knows what's coming. And it speaks to the incredible relationship they must have had, the incredible faith that Isaac must have had with his father. And in verse 10, we start to see the climax of the story. In verse 10, it says, And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. And it is said to this day, in the mounts of the Lord it shall be provided. That's the climax. Hollywood really couldn't script it any better as Abraham has a knife in his hands. Like, I'm just like, I don't know if you guys do this when I'm reading stories. Like, I put in dramatic music. <laughs> like, this is the time when the drums are beating and they're beating louder and louder. And he's got the knife way up here. And he's ready to plunge it into his son. And then the angel screams out. And I, I just, I don't picture this as being a soft little Abraham. Like, I think of this as a booming, loud, <laughs> thundering Abraham, stop. I want your attention, like, right this second, right? So the angel cries out, Abraham, Abraham. And then, like, the music just softens. Like, that moment, <laughs> that moment has passed. Like, it's like, I can breathe now, right? And so uh, he calls out and says, the angel tells him, do not harm your son in any way. And conveniently, a ram is found nearby. The substitute has been provided. And I can only imagine those few seconds afterward. I imagine Abraham, he has the knife at his side. He breathes a sigh of relief. And, and if it were me anyway, again, I'm just kind of making the story come to life here. You know, I, I, just, I just picture Abraham cutting those, those, those bounds that, that bind his son. And I imagine him almost collapsing on top of his son, embracing him with tears streaming down. And I imagine Isaac doing the same thing, just hugging his dad, just covered, covered in tears, right? And so, as a parent, I, I, I almost try, I, I, like, as I'm trying to put myself in, in this story, like, I almost have tears well up in my own eyes. So, I, when I'm reading through the Bible, I try and do that. One year, I read through the Bible in a year, uh, which was great, except for I didn't really get much out of it, because I'm not a very fast reader. And so, for me, I like to slow it down and try and put myself in the story, like, like where, where am I in, in this story? And so, as a parent, this is a hard story to put yourself into. And again, I almost had tears kind of well up in, in my own eyes as I, as I read through this. And so this is a perfect, absolutely perfect picture of what Jesus does for us. God asked Abraham to do something he didn't want to do. There's no way he could have wanted to do this. But Abraham obeyed and had faith. And God provided. All of us, by the way, all of us are Isaac in this story. We're all wretched. We're all evil. We're all deserving of death. But Jesus, I love those two words, but Jesus, here's what Jesus does. He sees us on the altar, and, and just like Abraham must have done, he, he, he cuts the binds or he breaks the chains that bind us. He lifts us off that altar, and Jesus said, I got it, I got it, I'll, I'll lay down, I'll lay down in your stead. So here's the interesting thing, when, when, when Abraham lifts Isaac off of this altar, they didn't just walk down the mountain and, and all was good, there still was a sacrifice. Did you guys notice that? A sacrifice still had to be made. There was just a ram, a substitute. An innocent ram was, was caught there. And that's a picture of, of the innocent Jesus, right? Laying on that altar for us. And I think it's, it's so awesome. And here we are in Genesis. We're in the first book of the Bible. And yet we see an absolutely clear picture of what Jesus is going to do 
do for us in the New Testament, right? And so Jesus is that fabric that, that weaves through every single book. And you can find him if you're looking for him. Here is absolutely a clear picture. And so, so here's how we take this story and relate it to, to us. To the Christian, your faith will be tested. At some point, your faith will be tested. It's through trials and those temptations that our faith sharpens, that our faith grows. You will be tested. There's a uh, quote, I don't know who said it. It's kind of a famous quote. It says, faith untested is no faith at all. So be prepared. The ultimate sacrifice has already been made. Jesus died on that cross. So I don't think God's going to come to you in your prayer time and say, hey, you know, offer up that first child and sacrifice him. That sacrifice has already been made. But he may ask you to do some pretty hard things. He may ask you to do some things that you don't want to do. He may ask you to go somewhere you don't want to go. Think back to last week. We talked about Jonah. He didn't want to go to Nineveh at all. In fact, he went the opposite way from, from Nineveh, and yet God still took him there. He may ask you to have a conversation you don't want to have, to build a relationship you don't want to build. He will ask you to do some pretty hard things, and, and the question I ask you is, will your faith see you through? Just like Abraham. I, I, I admire his faith. Again, if I could ask him, I would ask him, like, were you ever scared? I admire his faith. It saw him through. And so will you flourish, flourish in God's blessings when you do so? God may ask you to do some pretty hard things, and from the outside, your life might look a little bit miserable at times, but I promise you, if you are doing what God is telling you to do, you will have hope, you will have peace, you will have love, you will have joy, even in those hard, hard, hard places. I promise you, if you look back, you will never regret listening to what God told you to do. And so for those that don't have Christ as their personal Savior. You guys are still Isaac in this story. Still bound by sin up on this altar. Jesus has already signed up and paid to be that substitute. He's already died on the cross. He's already died that death for you. But you still have to accept it. You still have to accept him as being that substitute for you. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means that all of us were on that altar at one point. The beautiful thing is, is that Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The beautiful thing is that some of us have done that. And when you do that, God cuts those bounds and he lifts you off that altar and he lays down in your place. That's a, a beautiful, beautiful thing. But again, that's a decision that has to be made. I'm going to have Brian come up and play a little bit of piano for us. It's kind of background music. We'll go to prayer in just a second. But here's what I want to challenge you guys to do. Christians, I want you guys to think about your life, your relationship with God. Put you in this story. Put yourself in, in Abraham's shoes. Could, could, you, could you do that? i got to be honest. I'm not sure that I have that kind of faith. It's, it's horrible for me to say as a pastor, but I'm just being honest with you. It's a tough situation. No, no, way, no way you slice it. Or any way you slice it. No way you slice it. Any way you slice it. So I want you guys to think about your relationship with Christ. Where, where are you guys at? What has God asked you to do? Maybe you didn't do. What is God asking you to be doing that you should be doing? Will your faith see you through whatever situation that God has you in? To somebody who may not know Christ, this, this is your time. I want you to think about yourself laying on that altar. Because honestly, that's where you're at. God has said, I will take your place, but you must ask him to do so. So as we go to prayer today, if you all bow with me.